so free blacks who owned property in America prior to the Constitution of the United States of America, and thus the Constitution could not apply to black people. That's his argument. Now, Appleton in 5 Maine, 505, and also uh, Thomas in another decision, in, who was a student of Appleton, made it very clear because they provided nearly 100 pages of documentation that there were not only blacks in both the North and the South who were free before the Constitution was signed, but they also owned property and voted in elections. And there were also major black slaveholders who owned slaves in both the North and the South. Now that kind of changes your picture. Then why would Taney do what he did? Because it turns out that Chief Justice Taney was a major slaveholder and had major property tied up in slaves. The decision that he rendered in that case was purely to serve his own self-interest. Had nothing to do with law, had nothing to do with history, had nothing to do with the Constitution. It was a decision that he created to protect his own investment. And anybody who knows what's going on in terms of the modern law knows that it doesn't do any good to cite that case because there's too many ways around it. And there must be, a, excuse me, there must be a dozen cases out there to back that up. Now, the important thing is, if you go through and investigate what Lincoln did during this period of time, you find out that Lincoln seized power unconstitutionally and declared war unconstitutionally because he had no Congress who could make war and thus began the greatest debacle, life and death struggle in the history of America. More men died in that war than in all the rest of the wars combined, practically. I mean, I think we all know that. But the real rub in the face of everyone during that period of time was Mr. Lincoln went up to Columbia University and he hired a man, a professor by the name of Lieber, who wrote what was called the Lieber Instructions or the Lieber Code which governs the acts of a president under martial law. But Lincoln never declared martial law. Well, Mr. Lieber in Article 1, Section 1 of the Lieber Code states very explicitly that when martial law is declared, the people or the inhabitants of the country over which martial law is declared need not be informed. All right? So, well, well, wait a minute. Wait, you, mean, <clears throat> you mean he imposed martial law and didn't tell anybody? That's exactly what happened. Because from that time on, the courts changed, the electoral process changed. You, how many of you know that there was no voting in secret until after the war between the states? This gentleman over here is shaking his head. He's already done some research. He knows. What is the significance of voting in secret? Well, your ballot doesn't have any force and effect in law when you vote in secret. Only when you vote in public, as the Congress and the rest of the so-called deliberative bodies in this country, only when you vote in public as a lawful elector, not as a voter, because voters are a class of people whose property has been leaned for the good of the ship of the state to ensure the ship of state, Okay. When lawful electors elect someone, they always do it in the open. That's the only way a lawful election can be held. All of the forms of elections in secret have no force and effect and no binding effect on the politicians that are elected. All right? Now, you stop and think, you mean to tell me that since the war between the states, every president that's been elected has been elected because somebody wanted him elected? Certainly wasn't because the people's vote had any effect in it. Who was electing the president? Well, the Electoral College made a convenient out there, you see. 
And if you go back and look at the history of the Electoral College in the 10, 15, 20 years after the war between the states, you'll see that there was a lot of controversy in the, electrical, in the Electoral College, and several presidents, or, or men who became president, played some real fancy games in order to get themselves installed in office. Now, that's not covered too much in the history books and the textbooks. It is covered, mentioned usually in footnotes in many of the law books, not the mainstream law books. For example, those published by West Publishing Company. Now, you say, wait a minute now, then Congress is, exists only by resolution. Why do they exist at all if that's the case? Well, because... Mr. Lincoln used part of those 75,000 troops he called up by executive order number one, executive order number one, to go out and bring the Congress back into session at gunpoint. Every congressman, every senator, etc., and their principal members of their staff were brought back to Washington, D.C., and placed into session at gunpoint and throughout the duration of the war between the states, the entire Congress, the halls of the Senate and the House, were guarded 24 hours a day, and no member left without a military escort or went any place. When he went home at night, there's a military escort there, went with him. That's part of what the 75,000 troops were assigned to do, by the way. Now, turns out that by the time Roosevelt came along, and we all know because of Dr. Gene Schroeder's work, which, by the way, was very instrumental in assisting us, anyway, and pointing us in the right direction. We all know what happened in March 1933 with FDR and his executive orders and everything else. And a lot of people who know that the martial law was actually came into effect in a, during the war between the states, they say, well, then what was the point of what Roosevelt did? And the answer to that's very simple. Because not all states were declared to be under martial law by A. Lincoln. It had that effect in some northern states, but that was quickly terminated, all right? Very quietly, without any fanfare. But when all these other states came into the Union after the war between the states, their status was kind of up in the air a little bit because they were lawfully created, but the Congress that supposedly approved the Enabling and Admissions Act was not. So what Mr. Lincoln, uh, what the Congress did, or what, what the powers that be did, when FDR came to power, they advised him to uh, declare a national emergency, which included all the states, so that all the states would then have one common law administered under the military by which they were ruled. And by the way, people, for those of you who pay attention to the way heraldry of states and the federal government and everything else is displayed, I mean the flags and the symbols of authority and everything else, why is it the United States flag flies over the flag of Texas? Exactly, because it's a conquered state. Now think about that, guys. Texas and every other state in this union is a conquered entity who's incorporated by the force of military law into not a republic, not even a democracy, although theoretically democracies can exist under military dictatorship, or, excuse me, not a dictatorship. I keep forgetting. There are certain technical niceties that we need to, need to obey, or think of at least, whether we verbalize them or not is another matter, but there are certain things that we need to keep in mind that since the Congress now exists only by resolution, when the Congress passed all these Enabling and Admissions Act, where did they get the authority to do it? Well, the answer to that is found in the fact that since the Commander-in-Chief is the top man in the country, every act of the United States Congress, since they were ordered back into session at Bayonet Point in 1862, has has only been passed, has only been written on the basis of a pre-existing executive order. Thus, when Congress came back into session, Lincoln had a half dozen executive orders already written up and had many, many other acts that he'd done. The Congress passed a flurry of legislation, all of which ratified what Lincoln had already done. 